Hey folks, I'm Leonie Nikishin and this is 10 Rolls of Film. A couple of weeks back I posted my review of Aqua Copex Rapid, a high resolution, high contrast microfilm or document film, which also does surprisingly well in general mainstream pictorial photography as well, as long as you know how to develop it. I tried to cover as many things about this film and facts and history and also use cases for this film as well, but the video was starting to creep over the 35 minute mark, so I decided to save a couple of segments for a separate bonus episode, which is what you're watching right now. Let's get to it. After I recorded the segment on the resolution of Aqua Copex Rapid, I caught myself thinking, mm, maybe I was a bit too dismissive about the practicality and usability of high resolution films like Aqua Copex Rapid. So I thought, why not have some fun? Let's try and see how far I can push it. Let's try and see how much resolution I can get out of this film with the tools that I have. Now it's important to note that this is not meant to be a lab test. Uh, I'm not expecting to find out the maximum potential resolution of this film. Instead, I just want to see how much resolution I can get out of it with the tools that I have. Tools that are good at what they're supposed to do, but not perfect. For example, my scanning rig is based around a good full-frame digital camera, it involves decent lenses, my light source is good, my copy stand is sturdy, but it is not a drum scanner. It's not an Imacon or Flextite or something like that. It's not built around a 150 megapixel phase one digital camera either. And it's much the same story with my darkroom setup too. Again, it's fairly decent. The enlarger is good. It's fairly well aligned. The lenses are good, uh, but it is not state of the art. And I actually hope that that will make this little test more useful to more people because I would speculate that quite a number of my fellow film photographers have a scanning rig or a darkroom setup or both that are broadly comparable to what I'm using. So this test, I hope, will give some sort of real-world example of what you can realistically expect from this film with the tools that you already have. So without further ado, here is the 6x6 shot that I'm using as an example for this test. You've already seen it in the main review. I chose this particular frame because one, I like it and I don't mind looking at it some more. And two, I think it's a good real world example. On one hand, I've done all I realistically could to make it a steady, sharp shot. The lens I used was a Kova 150mm f3.5, which is a good sharp lens. Not the all-time sharpest, but certainly no slouch either. So I think it's a good example of what you can expect from most fast 5, 6, 7 element standard lenses in medium format and good telephotos like this one. 4 element Tessar type designs, I'm not so sure. I would guess that the best ones might play in the same league, but a lot of them do not. The one on my MPP microcord back there gets close, but isn't quite there. Uh, the aperture was set to f11 which is well within the sweet spot for this lens when it comes to resolution and contrast. And I focused on people in the foreground, which according to my uh, depth of field calculator should put everything from that point to infinity within the depth of field. The camera was in mirror lockup mode. The lens has a leaf shutter and I also used a cable release. So there was really minimum vibration going on while the shot was being exposed. Finally, the whole thing sat on top of a properly decent carbon fiber tripod and a sturdy ball head. But on the other hand, this shot was taken out in the real world. For example, the ground was not completely stable. It was out in the dunes. And yes, I did try to dig the feet of my tripod as well as I could into the ground, but still some movement was possible. There were people walking around. Uh, there was a fairly strong wind even though I did weigh down the tripod with my camera backpack and I also tried to shield the camera from the wind with my body, but I would guess that some wind still got to the camera anyway. Finally, there was movement in the shot because, you know, due to the wind, the bushes and trees in the foreground were moving. Of course, the people on the path were walking. 
Uh, heck, even buildings are not quite as stationary as we think they are, <laughs> especially the skyscrapers. Now we get to the scanning part of this test. I recently bought a new digital camera, a full-frame Panasonic S1, which is what is filming me right now. I really enjoy this camera overall, and it has an interesting feature called high-resolution mode, in which the camera moves the sensor around by a predetermined distance, I think something like one or two pixels, and takes multiple shots and then combines them into one, increasing the, the effective resolution, lowering the noise, and just generally making things crisper and cleaner. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to both test this mode and see what kind of resolution I can get out of Aquacorpix Rapid with it. So my scanning rig consists of Panasonic S1, uh, macro bellows, and then a 50mm f2.8 EL Nikkor enlarging lens. Uh, the lens was set to f5.6, which I found to be the sharpest setting for my copy. Uh, the shutter speed was 1 125th of a second. Uh, the camera was set to base ISO of 100 to uh, lower the noise as much as possible. And I also used a 15 second self timer to avoid any camera movement. The normal uh, one shot in uh, Panasonic S1 comes out as 24 megapixels, which is then cropped down to about 14 megapixels because of the square uh, shape of the negative. Uh, while the high resolution mode produces a 96 megapixel shot, uh, which is then cropped to about 61 megapixels thereabouts for the square negative. Both shots were then uh, inverted and edited in Capture One, uh, and I tried to match them as closely as possible in terms of uh, contrast, brightness, uh, and all that stuff. Of course, the high resolution scan is the more interesting one, so sit back and enjoy. I don't know about you, but I am seriously impressed. I mean, the crop at the end there is a nearly 200% crop, and we can quite clearly make out individual window panes in some of the buildings, even the clock hands on the railway station. Uh, you may have noticed some jagged edges uh, that's aliasing, and also the camera struggling to properly align elements from multiple shots that are on a sub-pixel level even at 60 megapixels of resolution. So I think it's fairly safe to say that my scanning rig is not capable of resolving all the detail that is in the negative. Yes, I could have gone even deeper into the rabbit hole and mess with you know, taking multiple shots at higher magnification and then stitching them together into sort of panorama, uh, but I wanted to see what kind of resolution I can get without massively increasing the amount of time I spend on one frame. I then did the same kind of test, but this time printing on my enlarger. Uh, now I had to make some compromises due to practical considerations, so what I did was take the sharpest lens I have that covers 6x6, six uh, it's a 90mm 4.5 Computar DL, uh, yank the head of my enlarger as high as it goes, and then print a 5x7 inch uh, center portion of the negative on the baseboard. The paper I used was Ilford RC Multigrade 5 Deluxe, the, the latest one. And the developer was Moersh Echo 4812. It's a bit trickier to show fine detail in the print than in the negative, uh, 
But I think, as we can see here, if we zoom into the same portion, uh, the level of detail is comparable to the high resolution scan. And uh, if anything, I think the print might actually be a bit sharper, because remember, there is no sharpening applied in printing. Uh, and of course, there are no jagged edges or aliasing, none of that. Uh, so it might just be uh, more actual detail in there. Now, it's worth noting that I neither the high resolution scan nor this print seem to resolve the grain of Aquacopics Rapid. So at least in theory, this film can go even further. So, what is the conclusion? What's the, what's the point of all this? Well, the point is that I now know that I can get, you know, a, a 10 inch square or 25 centimeter square print with micro detail. Uh, you know, detail that you need a eight time magnification loop to properly see and appreciate. Uh, and on the scanning side, I can get 60 megapixel scan, which, you know, just think about it for a second. If you print that scan at the industry standard of 300 dots per inch of resolution, you can get 45 centimeter or 18 inch square print with plenty of detail. I think it's pretty mind-boggling. Uh, also, I think there's, <laughs> there's a bit of a nerd factor as well. You know, just the possibility of, uh, you know, uh, wandering around uh, the print with a loop or uh, zooming way in into the scan and uh, examining all the fine detail. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed doing that somehow. So this film has loads and loads of resolution. No doubt about it. Uh, but the question remains what to do with it, <laughs> how to put all that resolution to good use. And uh, funnily enough, that's a question that is often asked about the latest digital cameras, you know, the ones with 60 megapixels, 100 megapixels, 150 megapixels, 400 megapixels, and so on. Uh, and of course, for some photographers and for some applications, the answer will be obvious because you know if you want to print huge or if you want if you need to crop a lot uh, and reframe a lot post factum, you know the answer is obvious. But otherwise, things are not that certain. I think, uh, and one way of thinking about this resolution advantage that is often mentioned whenever uh, films like Aquacopex Rapid have been discussed is that you can think of it as you know shooting a film size smaller but getting results of a film size larger so you know if you shoot this film in 35 millimeter you might be getting the level of detail and resolution more typical in medium format and if you shoot this film in medium format you might be getting the level of detail more comparable to large format to 4x5 and on a technical side i think that's possible i think the film is capable of it uh, in terms of cost consideration and to what extent that actually saves you money, I can definitely see some sense in shooting this film in medium format instead of uh, jumping to large format. Especially if you're printing, there is a significant jump in size, weight and price of uh, enlargers when you go from medium format enlargers to the ones that can take 4x5 or even bigger. So in that sense, and also, the, of course, the cost, per, the cost per shot of the film itself is much lower as well. So in that sense, yeah, I can see how that can be uh, at least a stopgap. Because, you know, chances are that if you're a landscape photographer or uh, perhaps an architecture photographer or still life photographer, at some point you will want to take the leap to large format anyway. Not so much because of resolution, but because of the creative control, because, you know, things like perspective control and the control over the plane of focus with tilts, shifts, swings, all that stuff. Uh, so I can see how like shooting Aquacopex Rapid in medium format while you are saving up for a large format and larger and film uh, might be a very good uh, logical choice. But finally, like I mentioned in the review, there is more to this film than just the massive resolution. So even if you don't need this resolution, even if you're not planning to print big or scan, you know, insane resolutions, uh, it's still film well worth a try. Uh, there is a particular kind of tonality that it's capable of. 
there is a particular kind of crunchiness and crispiness that it has. And by the way, that uh, crunchiness and crispiness comes through even in smaller print sizes and even in, even in, uh, in lower scanning resolutions. So you don't need a whole lot of equipment and uh, effort to, you know, sort of see that. So even if you are uh, fairly cavalier about resolution of your film, it's still a film worth trying. All right, enough nerding out about resolution. Let's talk about something far more artistic and exciting. Pinhole. Because pinhole cameras use, well, a pinhole instead of a lens, the resulting opening is very small. For example, my uh, pinhole camera, the Reality So Subtle 6x6F over here, has an opening equivalent to an aperture of f150. And what that means is that the exposure duration gets very long very quickly and it's often made even longer because of reciprocity failure. Now, in massively oversimplified terms, reciprocity failure refers to the loss of film sensitivity as exposure duration increases. And it usually starts being an issue from one second of exposure and longer. And the tricky part is that reciprocity failure occurs at a different rate with different films. And of course, your light meter does not know about it does not know what film you're shooting. So what you need to do is you need to meter the scene, you know, meter the light, and then uh, use, for example, an app. There are apps for Android and also for Apple devices that will help you out with that. So, you know, you can dial in what your meters told you and then tell the app which film you're shooting and it will make the adjustment for you. Uh, and it's very important to take that seriously because even if your meter tells you that the correct exposure for your tiny aperture on the pinhole camera is 10 seconds, you might actually need to expose for 20 seconds or 40 seconds or even a full minute, depending on the film you're shooting. And some films have notoriously steep reciprocity failure curves. For example, uh, Foma Pan 100, if you metered 10 seconds for a shot with that, lens, with that uh, film, you would actually need to expose it for a minute and a half, for 90 seconds, to correct for reciprocity failure. So with that in mind, I think pinhole shooters will appreciate the fact that Arcfocopics Rapid actually has a fairly mild reciprocity failure curve. Uh, with one second of metered exposure, you only need to add about half a stop. By 10 seconds of metered exposure, you need to add one full stop, making it 20 seconds, and that is actually all the information that manufacturer provides. But thanks to John Farnan, uh, a Glasgow-based film photographer who does really some excellent work with pinhole, we also have a guide for the longer exposure times as well. Now, I really enjoy shooting with my pinhole camera every now and then, but John is on a different level of skill and artistry, so if you want to see what Aquafocop Extrapid can really do in a pinhole camera, make sure to check out his gallery shot on this film. Link in the description. Alright, that's it for this bonus episode. 
I was really touched by how well received my first film review was, and I also really appreciated the influx of new subscribers. So, which film would you like me to review next? And more broadly speaking, is there an area or topic related to film or photography in general that you would like me to cover? I have plenty of ideas for future episodes, but it's always good to hear from you, my viewers. So talk to me down in the comments, uh, talk to me on Instagram and Facebook, links in the description, and let's chat about it. Till next time.